Well, folks, it's spooky time. So you know it's time for a spooky video. And you know what that means? It's FNAF in time. Now, some of you may have noticed that it's been a little while since I've talked about Five Nights at Freddy's. And that's because, to be honest, I feel like I've already covered all the weird tech and science that this series has to offer. I mean, springlock suits, artificial intelligence, sound illusion discs, time traveling ball pits, Fazgoo, the engineering of real life animatronics. Wait, hey, hey, Richard, the thumbnail for the real life animatronic video. It Huh. Like I was saying, we've covered just about everything in the series. The only thing left is explaining how the literal main characters of the series work. Maybe we should have done that one a little sooner. Today, I'm breaking down all the real world science and engineering to answer all your burning animatronic related questions. How strong are these things? How accurate are the endoskeletons? What's the deal with the weird tube things from Sister Location? Could you really fit a kid inside one and expect no one to notice? And most importantly, how do the FNAF animatronics actually work? Richard? Hit that intro. In case you somehow haven't realized this yet, the animatronics from Five Nights at Freddy's take heavy inspiration from the animatronics of real life restaurants like Chuck E. Cheese and Showbiz Pizza. And just like in FNAF, these real animatronics start with an endoskeleton. This acts as both the bones and the muscles of the animatronic. The actual frame itself is made of large metal segments, typically aluminum or steel. Steel is stronger, but also more expensive and difficult to machine. If you know your animatronic is going to be bearing a lot of weight, then steel might be a safer option. In most cases though, aluminum is far cheaper and easier to work with. Seeing as Fazbear Entertainment is famous for cutting costs at literally every single corner that actually matters, I wouldn't be surprised if these things are actually made of like paper mache or something. Now you've got yourself a perfectly good Matronic, but in order to make this thing actually animated, you're gonna need to find a way to make it move. The animatronics from Showbiz Pizza traditionally used pneumatics, or basically the power of air. They're actually pretty easy to understand. At every joint in the animatronic, you have a pneumatic cylinder, basically a little piston inside an airtight tube. When you want to extend the piston, you pump compressed air into one side. And when you want to retract the piston, you pump air into the other side. In order to actually get the compressed air into the system, you need to use a pneumatic valve. This bit is a little more complicated, but this valve has five different outlets. The first one in the middle is the air intake, connected with a hose to a tank of compressed air. When the piston is extending, the compressed air flows through the valve and out outlet A, which is connected with another hose to the inlet of the pneumatic cylinder. The pressure from this air pushes the piston, which extends the cylinder. The air that was on the other side is pushed out of the outlet of the cylinder, through another hose to inlet B of the valve, and out exhaust port B. When you want to retract the cylinder, you just flip the valve, and now everything works in reverse. Air goes out B, pushes the cylinder back, and the air that you just pumped in to extend it is forced back out the hose to exhaust port A. These valves are all wired up to some central control computer, which can release air at just the right pressure to get the desired movements for your animatronics. This whole thing is then covered in some foam pieces to give the animatronic its shape, and then the costume is layered over that. Put it all together, and you have a perfectly good and slightly terrifying mascot to sell pizza to the kitties. So what can this tell us about the animatronics from FNAF? 
well, while they did get the general idea of the endoskeleton under an outer shell right, there's also a lot of pretty significant differences. The first thing I noticed when comparing the FNAF animatronics to real ones is just how bare bones they are. And I mean, quite literally, their bones are too bare. The pneumatic cylinders required to make these things move are not small. And since they're only capable of linear motion, they need to be built into the pivot points of the endoskeleton itself, resulting in parts far thicker than what we see in FNAF. The midsection specifically requires a ton of mechanisms to allow for rotational movement that we see Freddy is capable of in the FNAF 1 trailer. That's not even mentioning all the hoses and valves to operate these actuators, the brackets and connectors to hold everything together, and the external air take and controller to actually operate the thing. Put it all together, and we find that a real animatronic is incredibly dense. Looking at the FNAF endoskeletons, we see, well, a whole lot of nothing. The bones are narrow, so narrow that in the O2 model, they had to include hollow rings to be able to attach the actual shells. While there are some parts that resemble pneumatic hoses, the actual actuators are completely absent, along with any sort of air tank. Of course, there is the possibility that the endoskeletons that we see in-game are incomplete, and the ones inside the actual animatronics have a lot more going on. But we do know, thanks to the lore, that Freddy and the gang are supposed to be largely hollow, and as a result, probably deceptively light. A real animatronic of the era typically weighed around 200 pounds. With just how much smaller the FNAF endoskeletons are, there's a very real possibility that you could pick one up. Uh, hang on, hang on, let me see here. Come on, Freddy, come on. Come on, Freddy, oh no. Realistically though, an animatronic like this wouldn't actually work. Looking closely, you can see that the shoulder and hips use ball and socket joints, but there's nothing to show how these things would actually move without, you know, like a ghost or something. I suppose it's possible that the Freddy's animatronics are purely electric. There are electric rotary motors that would take up far less space in the endoskeleton. However, these types of motors were rarely, if ever, used in animatronics of this era because not only are the actual units themselves a lot more expensive than pneumatics, but they also cost a lot more in power to continually use. And again, this is literally the poster child for corrupt companies we're talking about. I'm having trouble imagining that they'd be willing to shell out this much money for something that, realistically, doesn't provide much of a benefit. In reality, if you want a Freddy that can jam out to the romantics like the best of them, he's gonna have to be a pretty thick boy, which sadly doesn't leave any room for hiding your murder victims inside. I don't know why I said sadly, that's actually, that's amazing news. However, while the classic Endo 01 and 02s might not be the most practical, there is one type of endoskeleton that's far more realistic. And, in a twist of irony, it's the ones that everyone writes off as futuristic and weird. I think a lot of FNAF fans have always been weirded out by the fun-time animatronics from Sister Location. Like, their weird glossy shells and segmented faces are certainly a choice, and the endoskeleton underneath is just as weird. Unlike the simple bones of the Endo-01 and 02, these endoskeletons seem to be a strange glob of wires or tubes that gives the animatronic its shape. While this may seem like a bizarre sci-fi jump the shark design, if you have an animatronic powered entirely by pneumatics, you're gonna need a lot of hoses. Remember, for every joint and moving part in an animatronic, you need 
two hoses. A typical animatronic had 12 moving joints, meaning it needed 24 hoses. The Funtime animatronics, on the other hand, are far more advanced than your typical animatronic and have a lot more moving parts. These things can walk, they can articulate individual fingers, they can even move their faceplates for reasons that I can't fathom. To do all that, you're gonna need a lot of hoses, connecting each joint to a large central valve. Now, traditionally, you'd want to keep these hoses short and compact, so they wouldn't be covering the whole animatronic. Unless you're designing the world's most conspicuous kidnapper robot and need a large, empty cavity in the middle, then you'd need to reroute the hoses to the outside to make room for all those crimes that you've somehow never been caught for. Huh. It seems like every time one of these animatronics is rented out to a birthday party, some kids go missing. But who could possibly be responsible for this? I mean, surely not the guy who wrote his name on the blueprints or anything. So, now we know all about how real-world animatronics work, but I'm still left with one more question. How strong are these things? I mean, I've always pictured them like Terminator-esque robots with inhuman strength, but are pneumatics really that strong? Well, the force of a double-acting pneumatic piston can be found by multiplying the relative pressure by the effective area. The relative pressure is simply the difference in pressure between the two sides of the cylinder. Since one side is open to the air and the other is connected to the pressurized air tank, you can just subtract the atmospheric pressure from the pressure of the tank. And the effective area of the cylinder is simply the area that the compressed air is pushing on. So the area of the circular front face of the piston minus the cross-sectional area of the actual cylinder going through because there's no air there. Based on my research, animatronics like the ones at Chuck E. Cheese typically ran on 80 to 100 PSI air tanks and tended to have pistons around 1.5 inches in diameter with a 1 inch diameter rod, though this can vary. In a setup like this, the relative pressure would be 65.3 to 85.3 psi, while the effective area would be 2.35 square inches for a total force of a- Hey, me from the future here, turns out screwed up all the math on this part. Uh, the force of a forward stroke on a cylinder like this would be around 150.6 pounds, while the force of the back stroke is around 83.7 pounds. Now that seems like a lot, until you realize that an average human can punch with the equivalent of 200 to 300 pounds. It takes around 600 pounds to break a bone, and a trained boxer can hit with upwards of 800 pounds of force. Still, getting hit with a bare metal endoskeleton with that force probably isn't going to feel great, but if it's got all the foam padding on, It'll probably feel like getting smacked with a pillow. So, there you have it. A full explanation of how the animatronics from Five Nights at Freddy's actually work. And you know what? Not only have I gained a new appreciation for the weird tube guys of Sister Location, but I've also come to realize that these guys, not nearly as dangerous as they seem. I mean, for starters, it's physically impossible to get stuffed inside one of these things, and in the event that one does try to attack you, good news. These things are probably very light, and they punch about as hard as your grandma. You know that one meme that says that every guy has an annual that they insist they could beat in a fight? Well, I think I've mathematically proven that I could absolutely suplex Freddy out of his boots the next time he tries to interrupt my scrolling on TikTok while I'm at work. You heard me, Freddy. You, me, at WrestleMania. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alakazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby.